It's been said that men have become the tools of their tools. With the acceleration of discoveries in technology, I think most of us are scratching our heads thinking, what just happened? To help us all make sense of it is Tim Challies with his book, The Next Story, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion. He's a pastor, author, noted Christian blogosphere pioneer. Tim, welcome to Full Circle. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I didn't me. even know that was a word. Yeah. Blogosphere. How do you have time to do all that? <laughs> I know, he's a busy guy because you're, you're a dad too. And, I am, I have yeah. three kids, yeah. Wow, yeah. wow. Well, you are the one though that needs to be writing this book because, and you can probably answer that question, mm -hmm. have we really become tools of our tools? Mm -hmm. Well, that's always a temptation, isn't it? Yeah. That over time, our, our, our technology, we invent it in our image to serve us and then it likes to return the favor. So it likes to then make <laughs> us serve it and it likes to dominate us. And that's always the challenge living in, in this world is to, to use our tools to have them in captivity to us instead of becoming captive to them. Yeah. So what do you mean by life after the digital explosion? Kind mm -hmm. of explain that because I thought sure. we were sort of in in it and I wasn't yeah. quite sure what do you yeah. mean after and sure well around 1980s when most people would say that's where the personal computer migrated from the office into the home so it was around the early 80s everyone started saying you need to get a computer in your house your kids need it to do their projects you need it to do your spreadsheets and so that was really the beginning of the explosion and then it was carried on through the internet so now through our smartphones and everything else it's in our pockets it's in our cars it's everywhere so around 1980 is when most people would say the digital world just exploded in its impact into our lives Lives. Yeah. Now, Tim, okay. you say that there's three ways to sort of react to digital technology. Mm -hmm. And one way, I believe one way you said was uh, to sort of go all in without sort of analyzing its effect on our lives. Yeah. And then second, to be sort of like, you know, the, the term that you use even in your book is a Luddite. So it's like, oh, technology is evil and so on and so right. forth. And then there's <laughs> also a way to be discerning. So can mm -hmm. you kind of explain sure. uh, what you mean by those three? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, it's been said tongue in cheek that what is technology? It's anything that was invented after I was born. So I'm very oh. comfortable <laughs> with the things. I often go on radio and people act like radio isn't technology at all. Mm -hmm. Really, it's a world-shaking kind of technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to, when new technology comes along, we're often very intimidated by it, or we just jump in whole hog without really thinking about its impact in our lives. So what we as Christians need to do and what we need to model is thoughtful discernment as we use our technology. How can we use it? How can we be aware of what it might do to us? How can we be aware of how it will, it will impact our lives, the lives of the people we love? Okay, so how, what questions do we ask ourselves? Well, if we're starting the, the path of discernment, Learning our technology, mm -hmm. what are the things we should be asking ourselves? Well, the main thing is we're very, very adept at, at looking at technology and saying, this is what it will add to my life. This is what it will bring me. The mm -hmm. new iPhone comes out. I know exactly what it will do for me. What I'm very bad at asking is, what will this take away? Mm -hmm. How will this yeah. impact me? How will this impact my family? Oh so That's it's good. the every technology has benefits. Every technology has a cost or has drawbacks. We see the benefit. We don't ask about the cost. But our family, our kids, they'd be very willing to tell us what the iPhone takes away. But how do you know the balance? Because like I like Facebook and I have a Twitter <laughs> account yeah. and I love going on YouTube and going on these mm -hmm. great sites and even like checking out your blog. So yeah. I mean what where's the balance in that? Because I think I was when I was reading through your book I was like do I serve technology? Because I was thinking does it own me? I actually got afraid mm -hmm. that I was part of that. How do you yeah. discern that and make those choices? I think you just need to, well, I think one of the best things you can do is ask your family, how is technology impacting me? And they have this view of you that you don't have of yourself. And they're, as I said before, I think they're very willing to tell you whether you serve your phone or whether you, it serves you, you know, that who's really in charge there. And just to be saying, why am I using this thing? What kind of draw does it have on me? Try giving it up for a week. Try not using Facebook for a week. <laughs> Try taking a vacation where you get right away from all your technology. We did that two summers ago and it was wonderful, but it was also very revealing. What can I live without? What mm. can't I live without? You remember uh, back in 2003 when the whole Eastern Coast had that blackout? Yeah, yeah. My family, we spent the evening, we lit candles and we spent the evening playing board games. Yeah. And we we thought, how great is this? Yeah. So you're saying really kind of unplug, pretend there's no accessibility to all of that and just yeah. see how much richer your life will be. Yeah, there's some neighborhoods in Toronto that still celebrate that day, the day all the lights went out and everybody came out of their houses, kind of blinked and thought, wow, there's actually 
people. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and they still get together because this was the one day they all came out of their houses and acted like a neighborhood again. Because yeah. we tend to just go into our homes and have our little digital worlds there. So uh, absolutely, I think if we can just leave those things at least for a period of time to really measure mm -hmm. how, how much do I need this thing? How much do I use this thing? Okay, so Tim, my generation, I'm older than these girls. Let's oh, stop it. Let's just say, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I've got a married, a married yeah. daughter and, and young adult kids. And so I'm kind of the bridge generation where I remember very clearly what it was like before microwaves. Thank you very much. Um, but also I'm in the middle of the iPhone generation as well. So I'm kind of trying to catch up. But my kids are, I was telling you earlier, my son, who's 19, he goes to sleep with his cell phone next to his pillow, mm -hmm. just in case one of his friends texts him during the night yep. so he can answer the text. Like, mm -hmm. how do I help my kids to kind of get in balance? Yeah. Well, you're asking the right question, which is how can I help my kids? And um, the older you are, when a new technology comes in, the more intimidating you tend to find it, and then the, the less you want to help teach your children how to use it. So I think, um, Digital discipleship is part of the calling of a parent today, mm, discipling your kids in good. how to use these things. Um, you need to teach your kids what does it mean to live in a world where you have in front of you at all times a device that can be used to access the world's information. Mm -hmm. um, young men, what does it mean that you have a, this device that can call up a world of pornography in a mm -hmm. second? These are questions we need to be asking and then modeling for our children um, and having confidence that we understand scripture, we understand what the Lord requires of us and then mm -hmm. helping them showing in our own lives how to use it well and then modeling that for them. So is that when you say the next story? Is that what you're referring to with this book? Sure, the next story is, it's kind of the story we're in now. This is the next story. The next story is this digital world. So we, we've gone through various you know, through history, there's been various ways that information has been carried. So I think the age of the book is drawing to a close. Um, people have said that for a while, but now for the first time, I think we have something that can really replace it in digital media. And so that's the way we've always learned. That's the way we've passed information. But now it's migrating to the digital world. So here's the story we're in. How can we as Christians live virtuously in this kind of a world? Now, Tim, in your book, you say that um, we can make communication into an idol, and there's three ways to do that. Um, productivity, significance, and desire for information. And I have to say, I almost closed the book when I got to this part. Because I was like, I, you know, I didn't read this book to be convicted, you know? Um, so can you explain the difference between making productivity, significance, and desire for information idols? Sure, well I think desire for information is one that's just always at the forefront and that- That's me. There, yeah, there was yeah. a time when to know something meant I had that in my mind and in my heart. I was a wise person because I'd taken that, that information, mm -hmm. I'd thought about it, made it knowledge, I'd taken it to scripture, made it wisdom. Today, the virtue is not in knowing something, but in knowing where to find it. So if I'm, if somebody asks me something, I can pull out my phone and in five seconds have an answer because I can just go to Google and find it, find it out, whatever I want to know. So, so here is the virtue of the modern age, not in knowing things, not in being wise, but in just knowing where to find it. So how deep can we be as Christians if we don't really have any information in our in our hearts? What if it's just in our phones and we're relying on that? So mm -hmm. imagine a time you hear and throughout the history of the church, people who are persecuted, their Bibles were taken away, mm -hmm. but they had memorized scripture. They had mm -hmm. it in their hearts and in their minds. What if it was, what if our phone was taken away from us? What, what scripture would we have to fall back on? To Wow. Okay. The thing I do like, though, is that it's not, you're not saying it's evil, stay away from no, it. No. I, that's what I do appreciate sure. because we're all part of it, you know, this sure. digital world. But I think it's just yeah. being mindful and choosing and being conscious yeah. of what it's doing and how we respond to mm -hmm. it, sure. really. Here's the world we live in. We can't get rid of Facebook and email and cell phones and computers, all this. This is just the way the world has gone. So we can't go back. So we just need to learn how to live well in this world. Mm. We've been talking about your book, The Next Story, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion. Okay, where does the Bible fit into all of this, Tim? fits in everywhere. And I think the place to begin is at the beginning uh, where the Lord created the heavens of the earth. He, he placed Adam in the garden and he told him to go out and ha to have dominion over the earth and to subdue it. Adam could not do that without some sort of technology, even if that was just a shovel or a pick to get into the ground. So mm -hmm. technology is a good gift of God. It's given so we can fulfill our mandate to, to do what God has told us to do here in this world. So technology in the big picture is good, but also there, as you know, in the garden, man fell 
fallen to sin. And so we now live in this sinful world and the, the fall extends to our technologies. So they aren't perfect, they aren't mm -hmm. evil, but yet they'll be used to draw our hearts away from what's most important instead of what, instead of toward what's most important if we allow them. And so we have to be very wary of our technology knowing that it can, it can serve us, but it can also hinder us as we so, seek to honor the Lord. So that's really a consequence, especially for someone who is a, a Jesus follower, that if we don't, if we don't stay in the word and we're in community or church and we get lost in this sort of, you know, technological world, there are great consequences for us. Not just like yeah. physically, but spiritually, mentally and emotionally, right? Absolutely. There can be huge consequences if we're not um, understanding the, the place technology can have in our life. And, and beyond the Christian world, there's a lot of people who their hope is in technology. And there's a lot of people that think if, if we just advance as humanity far enough in our technology, utopia will come. This will be paradise. And of course, as Christians, we know better that our technology can help us serve the Lord, but it will never be perfect. It will never bring about perfection. You know, when you're talking about technology and scripture, you're saying that, you know, if we're not careful, technology can kill truth, right? Like as, as people of faith, we have truth. Mm -hmm. But the problem sometimes with the proliferation of technology is that it creates the illusion of multiple truths, right? And because we have, like you were saying, the information so quickly, we don't go to see a scholar. You know what I mean? We don't go and visit like a library. We just yeah. find some, type something in, even if it's the Bible, we find some, yeah. type something in. And whatever Google says is number one right. is usually our number one answer, right. regardless of the fact that it may not actually yeah. be true. So can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Sure, well, for many people now, Google is the source of truth. And if it's not Google, it's Wikipedia. It's mm -hmm. these websites are now giving us the source of truth. You think about something like Wikipedia. now. You you have your traditional encyclopedias where an expert in a field would say this is what's true. Now in Wikipedia it takes all of us together to agree on what's true and we'll put that out there and create truth together. Mm -hmm. That's so, scary. Or we'll take That's it out, you yeah. can edit sure. and add on. Yeah. Right. Right. Wikipedia has right. so much information like about mm -hmm. the Bible basically. You can, right. there, I don't think, I've, I, you know, I've typed things in and I've seen Wikipedia mm -hmm. as like second or third and then yep. sometimes you click on it and you're like, mm, Mm -hmm. this, is, this is not right. in my Bible, yeah. you know? Right, because you can go ahead and edit it. I can go ahead and edit it. My 11-year-old yeah. son can edit it. Anyone can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the brilliance of Wikipedia. But we also need to know, as we think about it, we need to understand the source of that information, mm -hmm. that it is crowdsourced. Yeah. There has to be a standard for mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. right. And that's what the right. Bible provides for us, exactly. the standard of truth. Exactly. That's our anchor in truth. And then... Um, so, so what we need to be wary of in the internet is just the ways it's, it's subtly changing our perception of how we can know what's truth. So Wikipedia mm. has one answer to that. Google has another answer mm. to that. Well, Tim Challies, we're so glad you've checked in with us because your book, The Next Story, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion is fascinating. Really, you. you really thank cause you. us to stop and think. And so thank you for being with us on Full Circle. And thank you for joining us as well. I just want to remind you that our prayer lines are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you're, you've heard something here and you just want to talk and pray about something, we would love to be there for you. And remember, as always, do keep your eyes on Jesus. It's all about Him.